Hello, everyone. I'm Al Daldegan, creator and producer of the Leaders, Innovators, and Big Ideas podcast, supported by Rainforest Alberta. This podcast showcases the people who are working to improve Alberta's innovation ecosystem. Val McCarty is in the business of helping organizations visualize, communicate, and execute strategy in real time. Her studies were acquired at both University of Alberta and Grant McEwen University and encompassed management, education, and human services with an aim to continue learning. Her previous experience includes the financial sector, fitness sector, and early childhood education. When Val is not at work, you can find her outside with her grandkids or looking forward to the next live jam. And now I'll pass the mic to Val for her continued conversation with Shannon Phillips and Tristan Ham. Take it away, Val. Welcome to another Rainforest podcast. I was going through the Rainforest newsletter, found this great quote I'd like to put at the beginning of this podcast, just in case there's any listeners out there who have not heard of any of the podcasts so far or of the Rainforest Alberta. Rainforest Alberta is an informal organization of entrepreneurs and service providers who work together to improve Alberta's innovation ecosystem. Their goal is to provide the invisible infrastructure within our province that enables entrepreneurs to invest, prosper, and move their ideas forward through education, communication, and an open invitation. So that's what Rainforest Alberta is all about. And on March 15th, we introduced Shannon and Tristan of Unbounded Thinking. We had a great conversation. Most of it was all set around the most traditional businesses don't know how to innovate. They approach it with little to no structure or the right skill, preventing them from leveraging their greatest asset, which is staff. So if you haven't had time, listeners, go back and find that podcast of March 15th. Unbounded Thinking Round 2. So welcome back to Shannon and Tristan. Thank you, Val. Awesome. Thanks, Val. Thanks for having us. And so last time we said that we would dive more into innovation forecasting. So let's do this round two. Which one of you guys would like to start off on giving us a definition of what innovation forecasting is? Yeah, I'll kick it off, Val. And you know, hearing you talk about the last episode we did together, I think we made a pretty bold statement to, you know, to say that companies don't know how to innovate. Hearing that back, you know, I, I, I still feel it stands true, but hey, if anyone wants to, to reach out and talk about that, let's talk about it. I think it's a good topic to, to be bringing up, especially as we're, you know, we're getting very excited around the, the, you know, the tech ecosystem and innovation in Alberta. And I think it's a great time to be talking about how we innovate in companies that are, already exist. But, but that aside, innovation forecasting. So I'll kick it off with a, a story. You know, the, and some may have heard this already, but if you haven't, I encourage you to go check out the articles and the podcasts around it. But a, a game designer and, and a futurist, her name is Jane McGonigal. And she created this with her team, created this pandemic game, another pandemic story, right? But stay with me. Yeah, back in 2010, and, and what's super funny about this pandemic simulation you know, game that, that they created, what it, was act, it was actually based around a virus that originated out of China, which is eerily kind of bang on, right? But anyway, they, they invited 20,000 people to come and play this game, and, and the results that came from this simulation were, were very interesting once the COVID pandemic hit. Because it came, it went from, you know, random game that they've created <clears throat> to now being a simulation, if that makes sense, right? And and what happened during the COVID pandemic was everyone was saying, "Hey, Jane, didn't didn't you already do this like back back in the day?" And you know, I, I want to share two insights to really bring it back as to, you know, what that means when we're talking about innovation forecasting. And so so Jane took this data back during when the pandemic started and started to share with the world. And, and one really cool example was how people answered the question back in 2010, what would make you break quarantine? Right. A really great question to come out of that simulation. And 
one of the biggest responses was religion, right? And and what was one of the biggest super spreaders for the actual you know COVID pandemic? It was religion, right? And and Jane was trying to with that information go out and get churches and synagogues and, and all of the rest to say, hey, you know, this is coming. You should guys, you guys should take your services online. And you know, did they listen to it? Yes and no, right? But the but the idea of having this information was was amazing. Now that we kind of look at it as a as a simulation or a or a prediction of the future, right? And and then the other insight was all about the the people that were participating in 2010 were now contacting Jane saying that hey, you know, we we just went through the the actual pandemic and you know that anxiety wasn't there for me, right? I was able to handle it and prepare myself for it a lot better because we already went through all that stuff in 2010. Right. So that the people who were involved were again were now looking at it as kind of a simulation that they'd already went through. Right. So, you know, with that, kind of a long-winded way of of trying to explain innovation forecasting, but it's just that. It, it's a way for businesses to predict or, you know, simulate their future by using that structured approach, right? It's kind of bringing that that futurist thinking into businesses, which I think is so important nowadays. And you have guys like you know, Bezos from Amazon saying, one of the biggest companies in the world saying, we are going to get disrupted. We're going to go bankrupt, right? So innovation forecasting is, is flipping that thought around and getting established companies to somewhat disrupt themselves so someone doesn't come out come along and, and do it to them so yeah they, in a in a very large nutshell that's that's kind of what innovation forecasting is we're going to talk more about it but it's it's very about, much about trying to get businesses to think more about their future to make better decisions today and I, I, i'll throw it to tristan i mean you, you can add to that as well Oh, yeah. No, I think you explained it extremely well. I think just another really kind of almost like byproduct of of this this method is we get to see not just that end result, right? Not where, where a company wants to be or a prediction of, say, like something, some kind of advancement that they hope to be or, or another milestone they want to reach. But what's cool is we get to then kind of work backwards and look at all the peripheral industries, aspects, people, governments, whatever, that are in by that, that certain piece of, of leaping, that, that, that innovative milestone. And so the whole idea is, is that we can start to do things to progress towards that if we can take a good broad look at everything that's going to be necessary to be in place in order to get there. So all the people that we wouldn't have thought needed to be part of that process. Now that we, we take this, this 30,000 foot view of it, we're able to go, oh yeah, like this, this industry is going to get impacted. So maybe I should start building relationships here or this, or this person, or this person. It helps us bring the right people to the table, having a conversation and seeing how each and every one of them will be impacted by this prediction, by this, this one company wanting to reach a certain milestone. So I, I love that idea. I love the idea that that we get to, you know, we get to think outside the box as far as who is going to be it is needed to be here to to make this actualize, to make this happen. And how are we going to start to get this rolling? How can we get our engines rolling? Because it's lovely to talk about it. I mean, I can, I can talk to him blue in the face, but we got to do something about it, right? No, exactly. Exactly. I know one of the industries that was really impacted by this whole COVID scenario of course, was Alberta beef, right? Because, and it wasn't the P, the beef distribution or the amount of beef coming. It was the poor workers that were <laughs> in the, the, the places where they, you know, processed the meat. And so even coming up with an idea of what if, you know, now if something like that happened, ah, they've been there, they've done that. Like you said, that anxiety level would just be decreased so much more. They'd have something to be able to work with. Whereas when we were all hit with it, nobody had anything to work with, <laughs> except of course, the people that had gone through that scenario. <laughs> there were 20,000 people were, were the only ones that didn't have any anxiety <laughs> over COVID. <laughs> That's it. They're not wrestling people for toilet paper. They're not like, yeah, going crazy. So yeah, absolutely. So can I ask you, we, we sort of asked what is innovation forecasting? You sort of let us know. So how does it help businesses or who are the businesses that you want to help? Or like Tristan said, 
how do we even get started? Excellent question. I'll, I'll, I'll start this off and I'll throw it to Shan. So, so really there, I mean, the, the easy, the easy answer rather is that any business can really benefit from this. I mean, any business that wants to compete in the landscape nowadays, in the ecosystem, in whatever industry they're in, having this kind of forethought and peripheral vision can absolutely benefit. But I think the companies that will be really, really well impacted are those companies that are experiencing either growth or some kind of change in, in, in their whole structure, in their whole system. And that can be startups who often encounter a lot of change as their growth painfully or, or fast goes really forward, or even traditional businesses that are now trying to compete with other competitors that are being more agile with the way that they're doing work and the way that they're thinking. So, you know, really, if, if we had to narrow it down, it's companies that understand the necessity of innovation. They realize that, that it's not just a buzzword, that it's kind of a survival skill. And they're able to recognize that they need to make some changes because changes are on the horizon for them. Or there's a problem. There's a problem that they're encountering and they want to be somewhere else, past the problem, be more you know, flexible with, with dealing with that problem in the future. So it, it, again, it, it's, it's best for companies that really have, a, have, a, have an understanding of its necessity. I, th I th you know, it, it doesn't need to be... A, a complex approach to, to innovation, right? I, I think it's building, a, you know, that, that futurist thinking into the, into the business. Does that work for a startup? Of course it does. Does it work for a small business? 100%. Does it work for a hundred year old company? E exactly. And, and I think, you know, as, as it's somewhat of a new way of thinking. Uh, I think all businesses will benefit from it. And I, you know, I had the pleasure of, of listening to, uh, Kerry Oshast, Oshast, I might have messed up the last name there. Present from you know, Alberta. If you're in Alberta, you know Nate, the the the, te uh, the technical college here. Uh, they have a center for advanced medical simulation, and this is to help with health innovation, right? And amazing what they're doing there, right? In, in terms of trying to simulate the health industry and how they innovate it, but it also makes you think. Like, why aren't we applying this way of thinking to to every type of business out there, right? So I, I think, yeah, I, Tristan, I, I agree, but the benefit will come from all for all types of businesses because I think in the end, the reason we run away from innovation, the reason we're scared of it, and the reason it's a buzzword is because we look at it as this big unknown, this big risky, uncertain practice that we know we need it but we don't know how to do it and therefore we just say we do it and try and shut people up the way we get past that right is is ideas like innovation forecasting that will ultimately bring more confidence right more structure you know less anxiety less stress but you know that that's involved in this uh, you know pandora's box that is innovation that we just haven't been able to work out we say we need it we say we do it but we don't really know how to do it this is one way to bring more confidence to, to how we innovate, right? Which I, I think is crucial. As Tristan mentioned there, innovation needs to be a survival skill, right? A survival tactic rather than that buzzword because you won't survive back to that Amazon kind of quote before, right? Of, of you know, we will get disrupted. Every business needs to have that survival tactic of how do I adapt? How do I become resilient? Otherwise, another company is going to come come along and, and knock you off. It's the ultimate risk management <laughs> is what it is. It's the ultimate risk management. So I know at Unbounded Thinking, you guys have a term that's called what's next. And is that that simulated approach? Absolutely. It, it is. Yeah, it's our, our way to capture, I guess it's kind of our branded version of a method of innovation forecasting that we've been developing. And so what next innovation forecasting is kind of the, it's, it's the, the banner for the podcast that we do. It's the banner for the workshops that we do and things like that. And so essentially, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll walk you through kind of the idea of it, if you like, is, um, well, I'll use an example, actually, because Kashana brought up this pandemic game and, you know, the pandemic caused <laughs> the, the, the pandemic we've been living in have, has caused a lot of interesting changes, a lot of you know, painful changes, but a lot of adaptation and things like that. So if a company is affected by 
the pandemic in some fashion or other. Say, you know, they 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 were a traditional business that was had an office space, and they, you know, now they 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 their their workers are working remotely, but they're stuck in this lease. They're stuck in this office space where they're still paying this long term lease. But they found benefit in the adaptation of of their employees working remotely, and maybe they've gotten some more distant talent involved and things like that. Well, they're still stuck with this problem, with this, this thing in front of them. And so they want to be this innovative company. They want to do something about this office space that they've got here. They, 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 they see themselves maybe utilizing this in some creative way, perhaps, but they don't know really how to get a Kickstarter. Essentially, what we would do with them is, is start to, to really define what are the barriers here. We do what's called a, like a clarity sort of stage. And we look at what are the big problems? What are all the barriers? What's everything surrounding this issue in particular? And once we sort of identify what is preventing, what are the big hot buttons, what are the hot issues? Well, then we'd move into a stage that we call iteration. So we, we iterate. We start to think about, you know, all the possibilities. And we start to go, okay, well, what, what could we do? We make a prediction, right? We go, okay, well, where, where do you want to be? What do you, what, what seems like a cool scenario here? And let's not be constrained by what is you know, what we're able to do right now, well, let's free our minds and think outside the box. Let's have a really big brainstorm about what, where you want your company to be. And so we explore that idea. And then we, we get to another stage. Once we sort of find like maybe a path where they want to be, then we get to an explore stage. And here we, we get in, we go, okay, well, let's see what are the impact of this ideal scenario, this ideal prediction that you've got, right? Say they want to make some money with this office. Right, this extra space they've got, they they want to, you know, they're stuck there anyway. So they want to think about maybe a a way to leverage this space, make it profitable, make some money on it, maybe contribute to the community, whatever that sort of decision is. Well, then we're going to kind of work backwards and 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 think, okay, how are we going to get there? How are we actually going to arrive at that position? And, and how can we start to pressure test things? How can we create little experiments so that we're working toward that? And, and, you know, those, what's lovely is the ideas are, you know, initially are really constrained in like, oh, well, this is, we can only do this because of this, and we can only do this because of this. But once they start thinking about the ideal scenario, or where they'd like to be, all of a sudden, they start thinking about possibilities. They start thinking about, well, if this wasn't a problem, then maybe we could be here. Like maybe this turns into like a green space or maybe a space where it becomes all about wellness, you know, and, and because wellness became a huge thing in the pandemic. So maybe they want to dedicate a space to that and maybe they want to open it up to other businesses to use this space or whatever that turns out to. Be. We start thinking, okay, well, let's hold on to that and let's not necessarily get roadblocked by what is not necessarily possible right now. But let's think about what needs to be in place in order to get over those hurdles, to get over those speed bumps. I know I'm, I'm talking pretty vague here. You know, once once we get really, really defined in the problem, we're able to think about more you know, actionable steps and things like that. But, but essentially, what we're really trying to do is to free their mind at the possibilities of what they could have. And then thinking about, okay, well, let's think peripherally what needs to happen. Say again, it's going to be a co-working space or something like that. That's where they're going to make some money. Well, okay, who needs to be impacted by that? Maybe the landlord, maybe other businesses to see what their needs are, right? Let's look at what are the constraints of the space and, and what are the possibilities here with a little investment? Maybe we can make the space a little more appealing. And so we start to think about everything that needs to be in place and how we're going to get to that end goal. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yes. Shannon, did you want to add anything to that? Don't think I need to add. Yeah, rather than I'd rather summarize what Tristan just said, you know, with my background, educational background is a science nerd. So I look at everything with a lens of, you know, part psychology, part neuro, right? If that makes sense. So for all the other nerds out there, you know, I'll, I'll summarize it this way. We, we, it is so easy to, to come up with problems right? Because they're, they're attached to these emotions of, I need to fix this, right? This is, this is generally why we've evolved to be innovative. 
And then that next part of, like Tristan said, to iterate, coming up with solutions are so much fun. Our brain starts, you know, flickering, right? I've saved the planet, la, la, la. But what we haven't really spent much time doing is that, you know, that explore stage that Tristan went on to, to talk about. That's what innovation forecasting is because our brains find it so uncomfortable to spend time in that prediction zone where we can't pull patterns together, we can't make it easy. You know, we're using up a lot of brain energy to try and get to a point where we don't have an answer, but that is such a crucial part of problem solving, of innovative and innovating, and that's where we're pushing this idea around, you know, innovation stops at coming up with ideas. No, 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 no. That's kind of like the starting point. The next part is taking those ideas and looking at what that would look like in a world of, you know, whether, you know, whether we know how it's going to change or not, but let's just talk more about it, right? Let's just try and imagine what it could look like. The, the amount of insights that come out of exploring what solutions would look like the unintended consequences, right? The ripple effects, use whatever analogy you want to, but it's so important to to take that extra leap to look at what that explore, exploration stage, <coughs> excuse me, would actually look like. And, and I think the, the banner for that is we need to get comfortable with being in the uncomfortable. We don't spend much time there and I think it's time to, to shift a little bit or, or at least add that extra step to problem solving or innovating, right? It goes from clarify to ideate. Now we need to really spend a whole bunch of time in that exploration stage. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to coin a phrase, to, to go where no one else has gone before, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and to have the courage to expect the unexpected and because who knows what, what that will bring. You know, sometimes it's like sharing and gathering ideas and on innovation. It, it can seem like herding cats. <laughs> but, but, you know, unbounded thinking has a way of giving structure and some sort of processes to, to that whole thinking. So it's not like it's going to get lost and it's not a runaway train. It's, it's um, a good method of getting the best out of your staff, like we said in the last last uh, podcast. You know what, Val, if, if, if I could jump in there, I you nailed it, but I also, my, my brain also says, well, wait a minute, it is about that runaway train because I don't think we spend enough time letting that train go off the tracks, if that makes sense, right? And, you know, I, I'm going to get Tristan jumping off the edge of his seat here, but when we, we use, you know, the sci-fi world, as, as an example of talking about how we kind of suck at predicting, right? But, but the sci-fi world, you know, it gives those writers that, that track to run off, if that makes sense. And we love it. We love the imagination of that. We get it wrong 99% of the time. But the idea is that, you know, when we encourage people to think outside of the box, look at all the possibilities that come from that. It's not just about that end goal. It's, it's what we learn as we go along. And, you know, I'm going to leave, we talk about one example a lot and I'm going to throw it to, to Tristan to talk about, um, but yeah, yeah, the, the, the sci-fi example of, of Back to the Future is an, uh, is an emotional one for me. I'll let Tristan talk about it. He tells the story better than I do. Okay, I'll do, I'll do this quick. I won't ramble, I promise. But yeah, uh, there's so many interesting things about, about the movie Back to the Future, especially Back to the Future 2, because Marty ends up in the future, he actually ends up in 2015. I think, which is really funny. But there he, there's a lot of like these amazing, like scientific technical advances and things like that. But one of those is like this almanac. He finds this almanac of every sports, the, the winning team of every sports game up until that point. And, and he's thinking, when I go back to 1985, this is going to be incredible, right? I'm going to make a mint, right? So he gets that. Unfortunately, it gets thrown into the hands of Biff, his rival, right? And Biff goes back and uh, gives it to his younger self uh, uh, back in the uh, 50s, I think. What, what am I looking for? Anyway, uh, so he gives it back to his younger self and with the same idea, right? You're going to be wealthy and things like that. But then Marty ends up going back to 1985, to his original time, where Biff is already wealthy. And the town is in chaos. There's like violence and vandalism and, and open fires and things like that. And, and, and so the interesting thing to take away from that is that we have this idea, 
right? We're like, oh, I'll just do this. And in the future, this outcome will be this. But so much can happen. And if we're not really prepared to think about, oh, but what if? And what if this? And could this be impacted? And should I think about this? It could end up in a little bit of a disaster or not happening at all. I mean, in the movie in 2015, we had flying cars. I mean, that's we're still a couple of years off from that. But it's just it's a neat analogy of best intention where you'd love to do. And then without a lot of forethought, there there, there is the possibility of chaos and things like that. So so we use that as an example because it really resonates well with us in that you can see like, oh, my, my company is going to be, you know, operating on cryptocurrency and I'm going to be in a virtual space and blah, 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 and all this kind of thing. And it's a lovely, wonderful vision of your company and where you want to be. But if we don't take kind of a good assessment, we can't take a risk assessment of what it would take to actually make that happen, how it impacts our employees, how it impacts our customers, how it impacts the community at large. It, it could have detrimental effects to that company if that's your sole vision without looking at those sort of peripheral. That's great. So just having that license to, to dream and go far out of that confining way of normal thinking. <laughs> I, I hate to use the word normal, but yeah, <laughs> what is normal? Normal it has a definition for every single person that's out there. So, okay, we have about three more minutes on our podcast. Is there anything that you would like to add, summarize, suggest for anything like that? I'll go, I'll go first to buy Tristan some time <laughs> to, to think about that one. But, you know, I love that you talked about, Val, you know, kind of applying risk management to how we innovate. And, and for every engineer brain out there, who struggles with the thought of comparing innovation to strategy. And you know, like I said earlier, that this kind of pushes us away to, to build confidence in how we innovate because it's it's that area of unknown and that's uncomfortable. Strategy is, is a, the pillow that you hug at night because you know when you wake up in the morning, it's going to be there, right? Applying risk management to how we innovate in, a, in an approach like innovation forecasting it kind of brings that best of both worlds together, right? Where we're bringing structure to how we innovate, which was the biggest fear and and uh, uncertainty that we've had in the past. So I, I love that you bring that up, Val. I, you know, I talked to Tristan about this you know, previously, but the, the idea around might be stealing his quote here, but you know, don't fear the future, embrace it. You know, it, try and build as much futurist thinking into your company as well, because. 2022, everything is changing like we've never seen it change before. And if, if you're not being, if you're not able to adapt, if all of your employees aren't able to adapt, and your company at a whole is not able to to adapt, you won't survive, right? So you find ways to to build this type of thinking, no matter what it is. Just get started by saying, "Hey, like we, uh, if Amazon's worrying about getting you know knocked off, we'll, we're uh, we we need to be thinking the same." And, uh, yeah, yeah. With that, I wanted to kind of summarize what we've been talking about, and, and I'll throw it to Tristan to, to uh, do the same. Well, yeah, and, and Shannon capture that. But Val, some things that I'd love to talk to you about more would be just you know how do we get wheels spinning? Like, with, what is it taking? What would it take to get companies to really you know sink their teeth into this and and start to give it some real consideration? And things like that. That would be a neat kind of conversation to talk about. Like, how do we assess buy-in? How do we get people thinking in the future? I'd also love to to to, to do a time where we could we could kind of pick your brain about prediction, like in, in within your field, within your industry. I'd love to see where you sort of see it, where it is going to be in a hundred years from now, and and what might need to be in place in order to do that would be kind of cool. But really, you know, just talking to you about anything is lots of fun. Well, there you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think that's a great idea, right? Yeah. Val, you live in the world of strategy. We, we live in the world of innovation. And a big challenge is bringing those two worlds together. That's That sounds like a good deal. That sounds like a good deal. So again, just before we, we finish, your people can find you on the web by? Unboundedthinking.com. You can find us on LinkedIn. You can reach either Shannon or myself. I'm tristan.unbounded at gmail.com. I think Shannon's the same, shannon.unbounded at gmail.com. 
But oh, and uh, yeah, and and uh, otherwise, we're trying to make a, a presence at a lot of the, the the great meetups that are happening with the rainforest and things like that, both in Calgary and in Edmonton. And uh, yeah, you reach out in, in any of those sort of platforms. Wonderful, wonderful. So that's Tristan Ham and Shannon Phillips and Allie, Allie Wilson. Great talking with you guys. And for our listeners out there, thanks for listening, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thanks, Val. If you haven't already, visit rainforestab.ca and sign the Rainforest Social Contract. Become part of the inclusive, silo-busting, sector-agnostic, all-industry, open-sourced, ego-shrinking, ecosystem-building, entrepreneur-focused, wide-open, social barrier-smashing community known as Rainforest Alberta. This episode was brought to you by New Idea Machine. We build great custom software while bridging the gap between education and experience. New Idea Machine makes your ideas real. Visit newideamachine.com for more info. Music for the show was created by Tony Del Deegan. Please be sure to share this episode with everyone you know. Also, don't forget to come by and say hi at the next Rainforest event. Let us know what you think of this podcast. If you're interested in being either a host, sponsor, or a guest of the show, send me an email at rainforestpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.